Good morning, everybody. It is at seven o'clock. Welcome to Wennington in Greater London, a village gutted by wildfires, sparked by the hottest ever day on record. Here, people left with nowhere to go after their homes caught fire in a tinderbox of dry grass as temperatures soared past 40 degrees. Firefighters called it hell. Dozens of fires burn too across the country. We'll bring you the latest on this story and ask if fires will become a thing of the norm. On today's programme, we'll speak to people from this devastated community, plus the mayor of London, that's Sadiq Khan, and we'll ask the government what they're going to do about the very visible threat of climate change. We'll be speaking to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, that's Simon Clark, and also to the Met Office as well. A crucial stage for the Conservative leadership race too, with tensions in the party rising. We'll be joined by the Tory MP Tobias Elwood for his first interview since losing the whip for defying his own government. It is Wednesday, the 20th of July. Britain burns the hottest day on record, sparks wildfires across the country and leaves residents homeless here in the village of Wennington. We have been told that there is a very high possibility that our house is already gone. I used to see these kind of fires on TV. I never thought in my, in my wildest dream that it would happen to us. Taking shelter in a makeshift refuge centre as the community rallies round as one firefighter describes the scene as absolute hell. We actually got the hose pipe, a couple of watering cans, but after two or three minutes, it was, it was clear it was, it was coming towards the house. From London to Lincolnshire to Yorkshire, flames and a warning that wildfires could become more common in the UK because of climate change. Wildfires rage across Europe too, with tens of thousands forced to evacuate in Greece, France and Spain. The French president will meet firefighters here in the southwest of the country while police question a man on suspicion of starting one of the blazes. Also coming up on the programme for you this morning. Another day, another vote with the final two Conservative leadership candidates to be revealed later on today. But who will be the pick-up of Kemi Badenoch's votes after she was knocked out yesterday? The cost of living squeeze continues to tighten as inflation is on the rise. We'll bring you the latest figures. Hello from Wennington. People in this village on the outskirts of East London waking up with nothing this morning after their homes were absolutely devastated by fire caused by the hottest day on record in the UK. 40 degree heat and dry grass, a combustible combination that led to several buildings catching fire, with one firefighter describing it as hell. It wasn't only here, dozens of fires burned across the country as temperatures soared. One climate scientist told us that wildfires like these could become more normal in the UK because of climate change. Dozens of fires broke out across the UK yesterday. In England, fire brigades declared major incidents in Leicestershire, parts of Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, Hertfordshire, Suffolk, Norfolk and here in London. At least 14 separate fires sprung up across the capital from Hillingdon in West London to Upminster in the east. The largest fire in the village of Wennington behind me required 15 fire engines and around 100 firefighters. Many homes appear to have been completely destroyed. Data seen by Sky News suggests that almost 1,000 people in England and Wales are likely to have died in the heat wave so far, 850 of them in the extreme temperatures of the last few days. That figure is much higher than the number of people who would normally be expected to die across the whole of the summer. Here's Aisha Zahid with the latest. This thick black smoke could be seen from miles away as the village of Wennington was engulfed in flame. Spreading at a dangerous speed, the blaze ripped through buildings and as locals were evacuated, feelings of shock were shared. I was scared, I was thinking it's going to get to us and I mean it was very close and I was just worried 
at one point I was numb. I didn't know what to think. I was just all over the place. And my first thing was get my kids out. I don't even know what to say because I've never seen, I used to see this kind of fires on TV. I never thought in my, in my wildest dream that it would happen to us. The helicopters start coming over and the more police uh, coming into our neighbourhood and, um, and it was it really spreading very fast. As they process what happened, residents gathered at makeshift refuge centres like this one. I'm not sure what the time was, we was waiting to have lunch and my son came in and said uh, um, next door's garden's on fire. So we actually got the hose pipe, a couple of watering cans, but after two or three minutes it was, it was clear it was, it was coming towards the house. We don't know 100% for sure, but we have been told that there is a very high possibility that our house is already gone. I was actually upstairs at the time and I actually saw from my window like the flames really close to the house. So naturally, very, very panicked. Only had a chance to grab my phone, nothing else. Following a day which saw temperatures exceed 40 degrees, firefighters fought numerous blazes. But what they saw here was unprecedented. We've probably never seen um, weather-related incidents, particularly to do with heat, on this scale before. Uh, but we do have well-rehearsed and practised plans in place. The full extent of the damage will take time to determine, but we know that houses, schools and churches in the area have been affected. What's driven the blaze? Well, it's the dry conditions as well as the hot temperatures, which has meant the situation has been so volatile. As sunset, the fire continued to rage, home after home destroyed. This blaze will be a stark reminder of the dangers extreme heat can bring. Aisha Zahid, Sky News. Well, that was uh, yesterday. This is this morning. These are the latest images from the skycopter hovering above uh, Wennington this morning. And you can see from those images uh, what is left of people's homes today and um, they may well be in the premier inn just behind us looking at these images yesterday it was their home today it's just a hollowed out shell they've lost absolutely everything we heard from uh timothy stock he's 66. he and his wife uh, maggie live here he told uh one of the national newspapers i didn't pick up my driver's license i didn't pick up my birth certificates anything so i've lost everything photographs records everything's gone the only good thing is that we are all okay you can see the um, church uh, still standing in the middle of wennington uh, but apart from that that row of houses completely destroyed one or two properties still there but one wonders uh, whether they will be livable for the foreseeable future as a result people find themselves um, in the premier in behind as i said and they um, are likely to be there for some time. We'll be speaking to the Mayor of London, uh, Sadiq Khan, shortly. Before that, though, let's bring in Egalea, the uh, Fire Safety Research Group leader at the University of Greenwich High. Thanks for joining us this morning. Looking at uh, the images uh, from Wennington this morning, I mean, there's, there's not a lot left, is there, for the people who live? No, it's uh, quite a devastating fire, but um, in many respects we were quite lucky because there's no loss of life, uh, no injury, and uh, the uh, number of houses that were lost were, were, were limited. So it's... Is that down to the fire service, quick thinking of the fire service? Uh, the fire service would have had a great deal to do with, uh, with, with containing the fire. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so what do they do when they get to a scene like that? Well, that's a, that's, that's a difficult question. I mean, what, what they need to try and do is... Um, if buildings are being uh, attacked by the fire they need to try and suppress the fire on the buildings but they also need to protect the neighboring buildings so that the fire doesn't spread to other structures uh, and, and then they which also we saw actually from the aerials yesterday didn't we there was a sort of natural break which would have gone down to an alleyway and so they were putting an awful lot of water on that just a fire engine coming through as we um, we've seen quite a lot of fire engines coming in and out, actually. Uh, as I'm guessing it's a, a shift change for now. Yeah. They've been working really hard, these They guys. have been working really and hard girls. under very difficult conditions. Yeah. Mm. Go on, Angel. Yeah, so uh, they, they need to try and contain the fire, but also um, tackle the, the wildland fire as well, because they want to try and suppress that at the same time as suppressing the, the fire that's spreading to the structures. So they've got a multiple tasks to do. Uh, and then they've also got to manage evacuation. 
uh, with, uh, with the police. Uh, so, so they've got a lot of things they've got to do uh, on the fire ground. And people don't want... To, we were just hearing there uh, from um, Tim Stock, and he was saying, you know, I lost everything. It's pr preservation of life, first and foremost. Yeah, I mean, life is the most important thing, and so y you need to ensure that... Uh, uh, you, you save as many lives as possible and, and, and you prevent injury from people. So that means early evacuation. And uh, there seems to be a reluctance to, to instigate an early evacuation in these sorts of situations. Uh, but it's always, it's always a good idea, especially when you've got high wind, as we had yesterday. Yeah. The fire becomes very unpredictable and so you really have to move the people away from the vicinity of the fire. Yeah, OK. Uh, we, we, I know you're going to be with us throughout the morning, so uh, bear with us tonight. More fire engines arriving here uh, all the time. As I said, probably um, looking at the time, we're heading towards um, a shift change. Sadia is also uh, with us this morning. Um, Sadia, good morning. You live nearby, don't you? Um, tell us about this area. Good morning. Yeah, look, when you come here, there's, uh, there are several cordons in place. We're at a different one to the one you're at. Uh, and as you drive around, you can't really see much of the fire damage because it's quite uh, far away. This is a, you know, a very green area, lots of green spaces in between, not that many roads to drive through to get to the village. Uh, but you can tell that there has been a very devastating fire here because uh, of these uh, hose pipes, these fire uh, water pipes that the uh, fire brigade has put down, you know, hundreds and hundreds of metres of these uh, pipes that we can see. But also you can smell the fire still, thick and, and strong in the air and, you know, lots of cold breeze uh, today, but you can still smell that very strongly. Uh, lots of the local residents would have had just minutes, uh, if that even, to, to leave their property. Some of them who spoke to Sky News last night t talked about how they've spoken to uh, the fire service and been told that many homes have been damaged, we understand that six of them have, but people still don't know whether their properties are among them. OK, Sadia, thank you. Simon Clark, Chief Secretary mm. to the Treasury, uh, is with us. Hello to you, Mr Clark. Your reaction to what you're seeing? Well, these are obviously extremely distressing images, and I think everyone's hearts will go out to the families affected by, uh, by this awful event. What it goes to show clearly is that we've got a, a lot of work to do to help uh, mitigate the sort of extreme climate events that we're now witnessing. And, and, and this is a reminder today, I think, of, of the importance of, of, of tackling climate change, because this is a, a remarkable, unprecedented event uh, and something which, obviously, as people have been saying, we are not used to seeing in this country. What, we, what we've seen over recent days is not normal, and uh, it, is, it is a warning sign. You said that delivering net zero is hugely important, and, and yet you're backing Liz Truss, who wants to suspend the green levy, which would help in trying to get to net zero. So, so how do you square that circle? That's a one-year mitigation designed to save families about £150 off their energy bills at a time when, obviously, the cost of living is so... Uh, it, it is, it's such an important issue. But, look, Liz is completely clear. She stands by our commitment to delivering net zero by... Uh, 2050, uh, and that is obviously something which this government is working uh, at pace to deliver. We have a £30 billion net zero strategy about changing our uh, energy system in particular, but also, of course, the shift from uh, petrol and diesel cars to electric cars. All of these things are, are, are crucial if we're to make sure that we uh, we indeed uh, do our bit as a country to make to make uh, yeah. good on our just commitments under the Paris, pictures, Mr. the Paris Climate I mean, Accord. Yeah, just... Sure. Just looking at those pictures, doesn't matter whether they're, they're electric or, or diesel or petrol, they're all uh, burnt to a cinder. What are you going to do to help these people? Well, obviously people will have uh, insurance, but it, the government will be looking carefully at what we can do to, uh, to make sure that everyone receives the support they need. And obviously the first thing is to make sure that they, uh, that they have the, the support in, in, in the very immediate term. People may have lost all their belongings, as we've heard, their identity documents. Uh, and, and I know our local councils will be stepping up uh, to, to look after people who've been affected across uh, the country by fires. But clearly, central government stands ready, as always, to, uh, uh, to step in as, as needed. Yeah, so people don't have insurance, you'll help them? Uh, well, I, I'm absolutely certain the government will look at whatever is needed to do to make sure that people are, are, are looked after at a time like yeah. this. Clearly, uh, yeah. it's not for me to comment on specific cases. I'm not asking you to comment on specific cases, but you are giving me a massive generalisation. I'm saying if these people wake up this morning in this premier room behind me and they find out they've literally only got the clothes they're standing up in and they don't have any insurance, will you help them? 
The, the government will stand by people who, who need assistance after an emergency event, as we always do. OK, talk to me about um, Liz Truss. Um, accusations of uh, dirty deals, vote lending going on um, yesterday. It seemed strange that um, Rishi Sunak only put on three votes to 100 and 18 um, to get down to the final three. Has there been some vote lending going on? The most important thing is that uh, Liz is within touching distance now of those, those final two spots, at which point, obviously, this reverts to the, the membership of the Conservative Party, the 200,000 party members, to choose our next Prime Minister. I've, I've absolutely uh, no insight into a any of this. As far as I can see, my, my only goal, uh, as colleagues is, is to make sure that the best candidate goes forward to the members. And in my clear view, that is, that is Liz. And uh, our campaign has been focused purely and simply on making that case to our colleagues. And, and, and crucially, that's, that's succeeding. And we, we want, obviously, to continue that, that hard work into today to make sure Liz gets into those final two, uh, to final two slots and gets to make her case to the membership. Yeah, uh, nothing illegal about vote lending, though, is there? We certainly saw that it uh, helped Boris Johnson during the last leadership campaign. Do you think it's happened? I, 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 have, I have no uh, insight into, it, into anything of that kind. Colleagues ultimately vote for the pe person they think is best placed to be uh, the next party leader. That's the only possible right thing to do and the only logical thing to do. And uh, I, all I'm focused on today is making sure that we make the case to as many colleagues as possible, that if they want a robust plan for economic growth, if they want strong defence spending, if they want clear action on the climate, then they should be voting for uh, for Liz. And you, you don't see it as um, um, surprising at all that uh, Rishi Sunak only put on three votes? Well, look, it's not for me to comment on what any other campaign might be doing. We're focused as a campaign on making sure that uh, we make the positive case for Liz. And uh, she's got a fantastic story to tell. And we've got just a few hours left now to make sure that we uh, get Liz into those final two slots. And as I say, make sure that she gets her chance to make her pitch to the Conservative Party membership. Uh, we'll, uh, we're being told that you all want a clean uh, campaign. Um, I know that Lord Frost um, tweeted about Penny Mordaunt warning um, that uh, she basically wasn't up to the job. Um, and you retweeted that and said that it was a serious warning. Do you think that's fair play? I think it's very important that people get to hear about the assessment of the uh, qualities of, of, of people who are standing not just to be the next leader of the Conservative Party, but our next Prime Minister. And, and, and Lord Frost's warning is not in isolation. It's been echoed by a number of people. I think it's perfectly important that people who have, as I say, worked closely with candidates get to uh, get to make clear their views. This is this is a robust contest. You would expect it to be, frankly, because this is an incredibly important job. And uh, people's readiness for that job on day one is critical. That, that is, of course, one of the reasons why I'm supporting the Foreign Secretary, someone who's tested in the highest office and has held a series of uh, Secretary of Stateships. OK. What happened with Tobias Elwood? Why has he had the whip removed when 12 other MPs weren't there either? Well, there are... There, there, there are look, I, I'm, I'm not a, a member of the Whip's office, but what I would say is that there are clear arrangements in place which all MPs understand, which govern the conditions uh, for absence from votes and of course most especially from critical votes like a motion of of confidence in the government which uh, has the potential to trigger uh, a general election uh, you can you can either get permission for extenuating circumstances people may be ill or have loved ones who are ill uh, or they may have very very important life events as i understand it mr elwood was warned about uh, the, the the seriousness of his absence he was on a a, a foreign visit uh, it was within his power to to return to the united kingdom to vote uh, he was in Ukraine, and we believe Ukraine is uh, number one on the Prime Minister's list. He's trying to sort out getting this grain out of Odessa, so doing government work. He was in the middle of uh, a bomb threat, and the airport that he would have gone back into, the tarmac had melted, so it was shot. He was in Moldova, as I understand, rather than Ukraine. He wasn't on government work. Okay. He's not a government minister. He is a backbench MP, and he was asked to return to the United Kingdom for a confidence He's vote, which was well... Committee. He's chairman of the Defence Committee. Kay, this vote was well... across about it? 
Kay, I'm not getting cross. I'm, I'm simply correcting a record on this. He's not, he's not a government minister. He's a backbench MP. The, this vote was known about well into last Who's week. Chairman of the Defence and Committee? It, Kay, that doesn't matter for these purposes. This is a vote of confidence in Her Majesty's government, and that trumps all other business. What about, the other, uh, what about the other 12 MPs, then, who weren't well, there either? Okay, I'm not privy to the personal circumstances of all of those MPs, but there are very pressing reasons often why colleagues cannot be there. People may be ill, as I say, they may have loved ones who are ill. Crucially, that's for the Whip's office to determine. They will determine who okay. has legitimate reasons for absence and who doesn't. This was a vote which was known about days in advance, and Mr Elwood chose to go to Moldova. That was his decision, but ultimately it is also, I'm afraid to say, a very, a, a very serious mistake. OK, well, we'll be speaking to Tobias Elwood, who is in Odessa, uh, about grain um, in the coming hour. But thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. Thank you. Clark. Thank you. These are the latest uh, helicopter shots for you now. From Wennington in Greater London, hearing there from the minister that uh, there will be support from the government if necessary for those who have basically lost everything this morning. I oh, can't even begin to imagine, can you? Just look at the devastation caused to those properties. Last time we had aerial shots from here, we saw these homes blazing. We saw the roof on the one to the left of your frame there uh, collapse, um, as Sarah Jane was talking us through the images yesterday afternoon. And that was the passageway. Can you see to the left that I was talking about there with uh, one of our guests and the fire service uh, heaping water on there yesterday to try to protect the properties to the left of that uh, alleyway, that passageway. And as you can see, they did a very good job. And the other properties there uh, to the left. Uh, we're going to keep looking at these uh, images uh, for you as the police and fire service go about their work. I'm sure that at some stage today they will be allowing uh, uh, those that live or lived in those properties to return to try to salvage what they can. But uh, let's bring in Helen Ann, who has inflation figures for us. Hi, Helen Ann. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Kay. Yes, it's inflation day again. Uh, we learned just how much prices rose in the 12 months to June. And unfortunately, inflation up uh, yet again, 9.4% uh, in the 12 months to June. Worth saying that was actually reasonably significantly in excess of what the Bank of England predicted for June. The Bank of England predicted it would be about 9.1%. So it's exceeded that. Uh, put this into context, as we often say, the aim for inflation is about 2%. So we really are in excessively high prices uh, at the moment, Kay. Um, a few very key drivers in June. The big one was motor fuels. Do you remember last month we did lots of reports on Sky News uh, where we spoke about record fuel prices day after day, those prices beating records? Well, motor fuels went up by 43% uh, in the 12 months to June. So that was a big one. And the other one was food, Kay. I'm at Birmingham Wholesale Market here uh, where there's lots of fr uh, fresh fruit and vegetables and meat poultry being sold out to supermarkets and restaurants in the area uh, these guys have seen huge increases in the prices they're having to pay and they have to pass that on to their customers that's reflected in the figures too. food another big driver of course these are the things that are very essential aren't they fuel food the things people just simply cannot avoid buying and unfortunately things will get worse before they get better inflation predicted uh, to exceed 11 percent uh, later this year. Uh, things very, very hard indeed for families and it is crucially one of the big issues that those leadership contenders will have to grapple with and probably the thing that many people in this country care the most about. OK, Helen Ann, for now, <laughs> thank you. If you're just joining us, you're watching The Breakfast Show here on Sky News this Wednesday morning. Remember, of course, Prime Minister's questions today, the very last one for Boris Johnson and, of course, we will be covering that for you live here on Sky. Um, we're at a cordon. These are our helicopter shots, of course. We're at a cordon about uh, a mile or so away from where these images are. Right now, we're seeing fire engines going in and out. I'm guessing, uh, as I said a little bit earlier, this will be a change of shift for these firefighters who've worked so very hard both uh, yesterday afternoon in blistering temperatures, 40.3 degrees, the hottest ever day in the United Kingdom, which caused, we don't know the actual cause of this fire at the moment, but certainly as a result of whatever caused it, there was the brush fire here in the scrubland around and that moved to this row of houses. Some 300 people live in Wennington, just on the outskirts of London, I'm speaking to the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, in just a short time. Um, and Yep, you can just see the church there as we're just moving out of shot, St Mary's and St Peter's. That did survive, but sadly, 
at least six other properties did not. We also heard about the fire station, didn't we, that was damaged by fire again yesterday afternoon. The people that lived there, the police came to their door. They had no time. They said, grab something to wear and get out of the house and we need to move now. And we've been hearing from some of those who did move and uh, said they've literally lost absolutely everything apart from what they are standing up in, waking up in a hotel just behind me here this morning, perhaps watching these uh, chopper shots as you are, as you get ready for work or school. Spare a thought for these poor people and the state of the uh, property that they called home until yesterday. Joe Wheeler standing by for us. Joe, um, the worst of the hot weather has subsided for now? It pretty much has. I mean, it was obviously extraordinary with so many records broken right across the country, but a high of 40.3 never been seen in this country uh, before. And of course, it's not just the fact that it was so very warm yesterday. I don't know if you can see behind me, but the lawn is tinder dry. We've had virtually no rain and everything is uh, parched. And of course, that is classic, uh, a classic situation for fires to start and those terrifying wildfires, which hitherto we've only really seen abroad and, and not here. It's been a, a very stark shock to us all, I think. And then today, such a dramatic change. Uh, we've seen Atlantic air coming in uh, from the west. Some of the warm air is going to hang on over eastern parts. So again, parts of Lincoln, you could still see 30 degrees today. I know that's uh, 10 degrees down on yesterday. Uh, but for many parts of the country, temperatures will be 10 to 15 degrees lower. And on top of that, we've got some showers early on this morning, those starting off in the southwest, uh, likely in the east as well, the far east parts of East Anglia and the far southeast. But then through the course of the day, we'll see more showers bubbling up in the south those likely to transfer their way eastwards. And there is, once again, a warning out for these thunderstorms because uh, we could see some torrential downpours, gusty winds to go with, and also the risk of some flooding on the roads. How weird does that sound when we were looking at fires yesterday and today we could be looking at flooded roads uh, and obviously some difficult driving conditions. And as I say, temperatures typically mid-20s for many, but uh, perhaps reaching 30 degrees Celsius once again in the warmer spots. OK, thanks very much indeed. Thanks a lot. So that's the situation here in the UK. We are in Wennington in Greater London on The Breakfast Show for you this morning. They've had big problems around Europe as well. Let's have a look at what's going on there. Should we extreme weather uh, uh, right around uh, Europe? Have I got some more to queue? Yes, I have. Temperatures are also causing wildfires. In Greece, fires have been burning in the mountainous region of Penteli, near Athens. More than 400 firefighters along with planes and helicopters have been deployed to try to control the flames. In Spain, hundreds of heat-related deaths have been reported over the last few days. Fires are still burning in Galicia and Castilla y León, where thousands of people have been evacuated from their homes. And the French president, Emmanuel Macron, is set to visit the Gironde region in the country's southwest today. More than 37,000 people have been forced to evacuate in the area, and many don't know if their houses will still be standing when they return. Let's go to France, should we? Siobhan standing by for us this morning. Hello to you, Siobhan. Tell us more. Hi, Kay. Well, I'm at the HQ. This is a huge temporary operation that they've set up over the last week. You can see behind me there, this is how big the scale of fighting these fires is. You can see those trucks there. This is a 24-hour mechanic area so that when those fire engines come back in on a rotation, any problems get mended overnight, they then go back out. We've just seen loads and loads of fire engines going out past us, possibly a shift change this morning. But the good news from here is that the two massive fires that they've been fighting for the last few days haven't got any bigger. They don't seem to have progressed overnight. So that is good because really over the weekend and on Monday evening, they were really, really testing these fire crews to the limit. Now, this afternoon, we're expecting Emmanuel Macron to come to the area to meet firefighters, to have a look at the damage. We managed to look at the damage um, of uh, some of the campsites that were burnt down yesterday. It was absolute devastation, totally wiped out. You could see the little areas where um, the chalets used to be, toilet blocks um, just burnt, all twisted metal, the heat of the fire. This isn't over here, though, OK? It is smoky today. It started to rain. It's much cooler. But they are continuing to battle 
those two fires. OK, Siobhan, thanks very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Well, our climate change correspondent, Hannah Thomas-Peter, has also been out and about for us uh, in Spain, actually northwest Spain, and she sent us this update. In Spain, a searing heat wave has fed a series of devastating wildfires. Some 30 or so are still burning, firefighters struggling to get them under control. And it's a particular problem here in the northwest of the country where we are, in the town of Zamora and in the mountains around this town. Tens of thousands of acres have been burned. Two people have been killed. Thousands of people have been evacuated. And the Spanish prime minister has warned that there is worse to come for this region as temperatures climb again. Many communities remain evacuated as they watch those temperatures increase. These very hot, very dry conditions all being made worse by climate change, feeding these deadly fire events and causing misery for this country and across Europe. Well, here in Greater London for us this morning, Professor Ed Galea, the Fire Safety Research Group leader uh, at the um, University of Greenwich. Greenwich. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've been talking earlier this morning about um, what the fire service did and what the police service did when they first got here. For people who were just tuning our way, they did it by the book, really, didn't they? Yeah, they, I, 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 they followed their procedures yeah. and, 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 they, and they tackled the fire in, in, in an appropriate way, yeah. OK. Is there a buck coming? Well, I, I, think, I think we have to understand the significance of the events that we witnessed yesterday. I, I think we've seen um, the, the nation's capital's first property loss due to global climate change and wildfires. That's very significant. And it, it speaks to the need to improve our resilience in London. Um, this taxed this fire and all the other fires around London really taxed um, the uh, London Fire Brigade. What would have happened had we had a Grenfell event at the same time as these wildfires? Would the services have been able to cope with that? I, I, I don't think they would have. Uh, and so due to this global climate change and due to the impact that it's going to have on uh, the propensity of having more of these types of wildfires, we're probably going to need to see a um, increase in the number of firefighters we have, increase in the, in the equipment they've got, the type of equipment they've got, and the type of training they have to be able to, to cope with these types of incidents. So what do they need to do? What, what exactly is it that we need to do? Is, is it more, um, of more fire engines, or do we need to look at...? I, I think there's a whole range of things. As soon as you bring wildfire into the mix, uh, it's, it, you really change the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the nature of, of what it is your firefighters have to deal with. And so you, you need to change the training, the equipment. They need more equipment. They're probably going to need more firefighters to cope with all of this. Uh, and p potentially we're going to need different types of equipment. Uh, for example, if we're going to see wildfires uh, of this scale and, and, and greater, and remember, in 2011, the nation had a wake-up call, the Swinley Fire. 2011 was a devastating fire. Uh, but we were lucky because the weather worked in our favour that at that point in time. But 300 firefighters were engaged in that one fire. Uh, it came very close to uh, habited areas. It came very close to Broadmoor Prison Hospital. It came close to Sandhurst. It came close to national infrastructure power uh, uh, generation and transmission. Uh, you know, and that was 2011. That was a big wake-up call for, for the UK that we have to deal with wildfires in this country. And Professor, we will pick up on what we've learned since then um, later on in the show for now. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thanks a lot. Because I want to go to Odessa now in Ukraine and bring in Tobias Elwood, MP. Um, hello to you, Mr Elwood. You no longer have the Tory whip. I put that to a government minister this morning. He says, it's your own fault. You should have known better. Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, it seems a lot quieter here in Odessa, perhaps, than back in London at the moment. But yes, I, I didn't factor in enough time, given the travel chaos that then ensued after meeting the president of Moldova, not something that you do every day. I'm, I deeply regret losing, losing the whip. I, I do hope it's only temporary. You were told to come back, uh, is what the minister said, but you ignored uh, government advice and it was very serious. 
No, I didn't ignore it at all. I kept the Whips office informed uh, the entire time. There are a few options to get back, but there were problems with travel uh, in the UK, runways melting, I understand, and there were also uh, security issues uh, in Moldova too. And combination of that meant that the, the few options I had to get back in time for that vote uh, then uh, disappeared. And, and yes, I'm, I'm uh, very sorry I didn't make it back. Uh, so th there's no more I can say. Uh, a very serious mistake is what Simon Clark said. What do you expect to happen next? Well, I think it's only temporary that uh, we know that there's new leadership coming in. Uh, I'm saddened that it's sort of spilled out in, in a big debate. I think the nation has probably had enough of, of the blue on blue. Uh, you know, wider picture, step back from this. It does feel in the last couple of weeks that we've lost our way a little bit. Uh, it's been a sad chapter in the history of our great party. Uh, the, the nation wants to be impressed and inspired, and they're not sort of demoralized by what they're witnessing right now. And uh, we need to perhaps exhibit greater decorum, dial the temperature down a bit, showcase the ideas, the vision, focus on those things that are important that the nation wants to see. That's what will earn us the right to stay in government. Otherwise, we're just going to be letting ourselves down and indeed committing ourselves to probably a long spell in opposition. Are you able to vote in the leadership debate, uh, leadership contest later on? No, sadly, that is uh, one privilege that, uh, unfortunately, I'm now lost. I was very much supporting uh, Penny Morden. Uh, one of the reasons why is because of where I am here today. Uh, there is, unfortunately, propaganda here pushed out by the Russians that any new leader that comes in will not have the same commitment to Ukraine and to places such as Odessa. I'm pleased that not just Penny, but I think all leaders will continue our support for, for this country, which is one of the reasons why I'm here. Uh, let me just, I want to come on to that, if I may, but just to finish on the point of the fact that you can't vote for Penny Mordaunt. George Freeman, who you know is helping run Penny Mordaunt's campaign, said yesterday on the radio last night, Boris Johnson wouldn't have removed the whip from Tobias Elwood had he been supporting Liz Truss. Do you think there's any truth in that? I, again, I mean, I'll be then fueling the blue on blue, which I'm actually trying uh, to avoid. Uh, so I'm... I, I hear George. He's a great friend uh, of mine. Again, another supporter of Penny Morden itself. Uh, let's stay high. Let's focus on what uh, on how we can move forward and make sure that we conclude this leadership campaign uh, to the high professional standards that I think the British people want to see. Are you quoting Michelle Obama there, were you? When they go low, we go high. Well, I think that's a great inspiration. I think we perhaps lose sight of that in politics. There is the frenzy of the event itself. It's very easily perhaps a fire from the hip to express your views and, and your anger. But it's important to remember that, uh, as I say, the British people are watching all this day by day, hour by hour. And uh, this is an opportunity in this leadership to actually uh, exude some of the ideas, some of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the discipline that was missing in before, but most particularly the vision of where Britain, Britain needs to go. You've just been discussing some of the challenges domestically, internationally as well. We need leadership in Britain and we need leadership in Europe as well. That's what's missing. There's a gap in the market for that, and I want Britain to fill that gap. OK, as we continue to <clears throat> look at images uh, of uh, Wennington and the destruction that was caused by those wildfires yesterday, tell me why you're in Odessa uh, and on uh, whose authority? Well, firstly, I was in Moldova meeting the President Sandu there. She's very nervous indeed. Uh, Mikhailov is only uh, 60 miles away. Uh, that's the front line. And if uh, that falls, Odessa here becomes the front line. Uh, Russia wants to take this city. Uh, the Russian Empire included this as their big warm water port, and uh, they want it back. And uh, that then means uh, Moldova is then on the front line. They're calling out for help, and I hope Britain will respond uh, to that. More importantly, though, behind me is the Black Sea. Uh, we have three big ports here, and they provide the grain for the rest of the world. We've learned to understand that Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe and beyond. But as you see, none of the ships are moving. So I'm here to see whether there's a plan that we can remove Odessa from the conflict, turn it into a UN humanitarian safe haven, which then means that the ships can be filled with uh, the grain and then move out here down through the Bosphorus Strait, uh, potentially uh, protected by a coalition of the willing, but under a UN mandate. If we don't do this, then not only will Ukraine's economy uh, suffer, 
but also the cost of living crisis in Britain will be affected because the price of grain will remain high. More critically, there's countries such as Egypt, uh, Lebanon, Somalia, Yemen, where you'll see mass starvation, famine and so forth, which will cause even more problems for the international community. There is a solution here that we could pursue, and I do hope Britain will support this. OK, it's uh, good to talk to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us, uh, Mr Elwood. Uh, hopefully you will be back safe and sound in the UK before too long. Thank you. Thank you. Tamara standing by for us this morning. Hello to you, Tamara, as, uh, as this, these are returning to live shots now, live images um, from... Actually, these are the latest images, sorry about the latest images from Wennington this morning and the destruction that has been caused by those wildfires yesterday. Uh, officially being told six properties were destroyed, but you can see the aftermath of those fires that raged out of control for quite a lot of yesterday as temperatures reached 40.3 degrees, the hottest ever recorded here in the UK. As promised, Tamara is with us. Hello to you. Um, tomorrow, we're hearing there about um, dirty tricks and also about the, the whip being removed. Tell us more. That's right. Well, today is the final round of voting. If you thought it was never going to end in the Tory leadership contest, and we will see the final two candidates emerge who will then have the whole of the summer to set out their stall to Conservative Party members before the new Prime Minister is chosen in September. But last round of MPs voting, and essentially it is a last-ditch scramble for votes between Liz Truss and Penny Mordaunt, who both want to be in second place, almost certainly along alongside Rishi Sunak, who is set to gain a place in the final runoff. And so with only six votes separating them yesterday, every vote counts. And there are accusations that the whip was removed from Tobias Elwood, who is a key supporter of Penny Mordaunt and someone not very much liked by Downing Street because he has been very critical of Boris Johnson. The suggestion is that uh, it was removed uh, from him for that reason. That is denied uh, by uh, the government and uh, Tobias Elwood, who did suggest that he had been a victim of what he called blue-on-blue blue hostilities, Conservatives turning on each other, and it was time to come back together afterwards. So there will certainly be more controversy about that if it is very, very close. When we spoke to Simon Clark, Treasury Minister and supporter of Liz Truss, he said that she was getting very near to being in the final two. This is what he said. The most important thing is that uh, Liz is within touching distance now of those those final two spots, at which point, obviously, this reverts to the, the membership of the Conservative Party, the 200,000 party members, to choose our next Prime Minister. I've, I've absolutely uh, no insight into a, any of this. As far as I can see, my, my only goal, uh, as colleagues is, is to make sure that the best candidate goes forward to the members, and in my clear view, that is, that is Liz. He says he doesn't know anything about dirty tricks, although there are um, a lot of confusion about the, some of the numbers that emerged in that ballot yesterday, particularly that Tom Tugendhat's votes, uh, many of whom appears in the Liz Truss column, which is not what colleagues uh, expected, although uh, one official working for one of the other camps said it's hard to know uh, what is malice and what is uh, just churn of votes at this stage. But we'll get the result at four o'clock. OK, thanks so much. Tamara, thank you. Lots coming up today, actually, as Tamara was saying. Uh, it's the final Prime Minister's question time for Boris Johnson, certainly appearing in the Commons for what will be his uh, last PMQs. Of course, you can watch it live, can't you, here on Sky? Yes, you can. It's at midday, the final Prime Minister's question time for Boris Johnson, midday today. And a reminder, MPs will vote, as Tamara was saying, for the last time today to decide which two leadership hopefuls should go through to the runoff vote among Conservative Party members, grassroots members as we call them, about 150,000 or thereabouts. It's worth bearing in mind that that is 0.3% of the electorate, which means that 99.7% of the electorate will have no say in who is the next Prime Minister. Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, is with us now. Um, hello to you, Mr Mayor. Lots to talk about. I wonder if we could just pick up on that. Do you have a view on who you'd like to see as the next Prime Minister? Yeah, I do. It should be Keir Starmer. I, should, I think whoever wins the Tory leadership contest uh, should uh, call a general election so the British public can have a choice to have a fresh start. All these candidates are continuity Boris Johnson. They supported, defended and have enabled 
him to be Prime Minister for more than three years. And I think the British public should have a say rather than just those who are members of the Tory party. Uh, well, you know that's not going to happen. Do you have a, sh a view of the, which of, the, of those three? Well, well, no. I, th I think uh, Rishi Sunak uh, is the architect of, of what we've seen in the last uh, two, three years in relation to our economy. Uh, you know, we know Liz Truss is a big ally of uh, Boris Johnson. Uh, I know less about Penny, Penny Morden, uh, but, you know, uh, the reality is all three of them have been big supporters, defenders and enablers of uh, Boris Johnson. What's important, though, is uh, until uh, the new leader is elected, we should have a prime minister doing his job. And I think what Boris Johnson should do is step aside. Uh, he can have further parties and, you know, become Tom Cruise and allow Dominic Raab to be the caretaker prime minister, because we need a full time prime minister uh, looking after the well-being of our country rather than somebody who's checked out. OK, let's talk about the concerns of the people who used to live in these houses that we're looking at at the moment or on a split screen uh, so we can see while we're still talking to you, Mr Khan. Uh, you, it's within your remit. You're, you're responsible for the welfare of these poor people. What happens now? So yesterday was the busiest day for the fire service in London since the Second World War. Uh, on a normal uh, day, the fire service receives, roughly speaking, uh, 350 calls uh, on a busy day. 500 calls yesterday they received more than 2600 calls uh, more than a dozen simultaneous fires requiring 30 engines like the one you're at uh, a couple requiring 15 some requiring 12 some requiring 10 and that's why the fire service declared a major incident i'm afraid the bad news is as we can see from the images 41 properties destroyed in uh, london 16 five fighters were, were, were injured to some extent, two taken to hospital because of heat stress. It is really important, though, for us to recognise uh, that one of the consequences of climate change are these sorts of temperatures which lead to the sort of fires you're seeing behind you. The challenge in London is we've got a lot of grass, uh, you know, a lot of green spaces, but it, a lot of it impinges on properties. And when you've not had rain for the lo a long period, when the grass is incredibly dry, fires can start very quickly and spread even faster because of wind, and that leads to properties being uh, destroyed. The good news is uh, the fire service today uh, will be providing an excellent service. The first fire engine today will reach you within six minutes, six minutes. the second fire engine within eight, eight. Yesterday, it was taking 20 minutes because of the pressure the fire service was under. You said 41 properties destroyed. Sorry, can you just um, tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, yeah, so a number of properties across uh, London destroyed. Some homes, uh, as we're seeing, uh, some warehouses uh, and other properties uh, as well. And a major factor was in some of these properties being destroyed was their proximity to grass. You know, many properties in London are, are next to grass. And it's similar to what you see in California and in the south of France uh, in relation to fires next to densely populated areas. Uh, so, in this country, uh, the, the main fires of this scale we see is in the national parks or the moors, which don't impinge a property. Unfortunately, in London, many of our, our properties, are, which is a good thing uh, for the vast majority of the time, many of our properties are next to green spaces. But one of the downsides is when you have this exceptional weather, this uh, you know, red alert level four, according to the Met Office, uh, you, know, you have situations where fires can start easily and spread even faster. Um, this area is not within the ULES zone. ULES zone very important to you, of course, isn't it, in trying to um, tackle climate change. Um, is that something that you're going to have to look at and spread that area out even further? Well, there's, there's one of the things that really makes me angry in relation to what we've seen in the last few days is it takes what we've seen in the last few days, this extreme weather, this heat wave, level four red alert, uh, at the same time, there's a, a leadership contest to choose our next prime minister, uh, and no one's talking about uh, the elephant in the room, which is climate change causing the sort of heat waves where temperatures are exceeding 40 degrees. We've got a situation where we have heat waves every two or three years rather than every 10 or 15 years, and the temperatures aren't mid 20s, they're approaching 40 degrees, if not higher, leading to the fires we saw uh, yesterday uh, and many excess uh, deaths. And what we should be doing is dealing with the consequences of climate change and air quality, cleaning up the air, uh, less premature deaths, less children with stunted uh, lungs, less carbon emissions, but also dealing with the causes uh, as well. And what we're doing in London 
is dealing with the causes of climate change and air quality by uh, having policies that reduce carbon emissions, reduce nitrogen dioxide, reduce particular matter like the low emission zone, plant record numbers of trees, uh, having water fountains across our city, cooling our homes, uh, air conditioned new trains. But we need support from the government as well because we can't do it alone. And the only people that can really support us to tackle climate change in terms of the causes but also the consequences are the government. Rather than us kicking the can down the road, we should be sprinting to get to zero carbon. So you're saying the government's failing on, on climate change, on their climate policies. So what are you suggesting? Well, a number of a number of things we can do. Look, one of the biggest issues we face are energy bills. That's because we're relying upon, you know, gas and oil from, you know, Russia or Qatar or Saudi Arabia. Uh, why don't we use this crisis as an opportunity to invest in wind and solar so we're not reliant. We have energy security and it brings the bills down. One of the big challenges we face post-Brexit is what's the future of our economy. I think there should be high-skilled, well-paid jobs. Why don't we be investing in people, insulating people's homes, in installing cooling systems, putting double glazing in? That will lead to energy efficiency, less carbon emissions, but lower bills because uh, homes are more uh, efficient. Uh, you know, district heating pumps. Uh, we should be, you know, be, be the people that are solving these problems uh, using the opportunity of a crisis to create prosperity and wealth rather than kicking the can down the road, uh, asking for a green pass rather than dealing with these big challenges. You know, a lot of the problems we have today are a direct consequence of climate change, excess death because of the heat wave, the sort of fires we saw yesterday, energy bills are escalating, uh, you know, uh, people being in uh, jobs that aren't well paid, lower skilled jobs. A lot of these problems can be solved by tackling climate change expediently uh, rather than, you know, rather than kicking the can down the road. And what advice are you giving to the people of Greater London over the next few days? I mean, it is getting cooler now. I, I heard talk of uh, barbecues being banned, certainly uh, in parks. I know that when they have um, hot days, or used to when they had um, very hot days in Australia, barbecues were just banned. No one could have one, even in their back garden. Yeah, uh, look, these are exceptional times. Uh, and because of uh, the ease with which grass is catching fire, and the, the, the speed with which it spreads, uh, we are advising people not to have barbecues, uh, not to have barbecues in your balcony, uh, at parks, nor in your private garden for today. These are exceptional times which call for exceptional measures. None of us wants to be a party pooper, but how would you feel if you had a barbecue in your back garden and uh, some of the grass, which is like hay, caught fire and it spread, uh, damaged your property, risked your well-being and spread to your neighbours. Our firefighters are working incredibly hard. They're, 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 they're heroes yesterday. Uh, they need some respite as well. Uh, a very simple thing we can do is just another day uh, without a barbecue. And please, also, if you're near water, don't be tempted to jump in, whether it's the Thames, whether it's a canal, or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, other forms of uh, water. Over the last few days across the country, we've seen nine people losing their lives in London. Tragically, a 14-year-old child jumped into the river near Hampton. Uh, his body was recovered yesterday. So let's try and be sensible uh, whilst we're going through this heat wave to support public services, but to support each other as well. Um, we must leave it there, Mr Mayor. Thank you for sparing your time for us this morning. Much appreciated. Stay safe. Thank you, you too. Assistant Director of Kent Fire and Rescue Service, Matt Dedman, is with us now. Hello to you. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Um, looking at these images, I mean, the firefighters did absolutely everything humanly possible today uh, and yesterday to try to uh, contain this fire. What will be happening today? Yeah, so as you said, really, really challenging time over uh, the last 24 hour period, as was expected with the extreme heat that we were seeing, uh, both within Kent here and as you can see from the pictures elsewhere up and down the country. Um, firefighters working incredibly hard in extremely punishing conditions uh, to limit the spread of, of these wildfires that we're seeing. We've uh, had a significant presence at a number of large-scale incidents, uh, such as those we've seen uh, on the heath, in particular in Dartford, uh, in the, kind of the southeast uh, area of London um, and, and around uh, the surrounding areas. Today, um, we scaled down operations overnight um, due to uh, the, the darkness. Today, we'll be uh, standing resources back up in order to uh, finally resolve those incidents, turn over, damp down those scenes and take stock of where we are. We've got a plan uh, going into place, uh, as you would imagine, for uh, the remainder of the week in terms of making sure that we have enough resources uh, to meet any of the challenges that the weather may continue to present us uh, as, as we go forward. OK, uh, so just to clarify, was it Kent or London Fire, fire Service that was the lead on this wire? 
Uh, the Wellington incident, uh, that was a London Fire Brigade uh, incident. Um, Kent has uh, obviously adjoins um, close to, to, to that area, but on the Kent side, and we were dealing with similar heathland type fires uh, in the Dartford area. So what can you tell us as an update about, um, uh, was there any injuries to be reported and how many properties were damaged? So fortunately here within Kent, uh, the property damage was relatively limited. Uh, we had uh, a serious house fire in Borough Green, um, but in the Dartford Heath area, we managed to uh, prevent the spread of fire from the Heathland to uh, surrounding properties um, through putting in place uh, a large number of resources. At one time, we had 150 firefighters and 30 fire engines on scene, working hard to make sure that the public uh, remains safe. Uh, and obviously, um, just in terms of what the public can do to help us as we move forward over the next 24, 48 hours, you just heard Sadiq Khan there outlining some of the safety messages uh, around ensuring that uh, you're not having fires in the open, um, making sure that when it comes to things like water safety, uh, you're treating that with absolute respect, not jumping into rivers uh, and so on, which of course will help to ensure that our response can remain resilient through this period and that we're only then required for the most serious, uh, of course. Okay, well, thank you so much, sir, for taking the time to join us. Hopefully it will be a choir today for you and your men you. and women today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, these are the latest images from Wennington uh, in Greater London, uh, the morning after the day before, when, uh, as you can see, a brush fire now out, hopefully um, swept across the landscape here. Absolutely devastating, this small community. Only 300 people live here. Basically, that's it. It's just one road. What you can see is this village in Greater London. This morning, six of those properties have been absolutely destroyed uh, everything that was inside those properties now gone those that live there are in a hotel behind me what happens next we'll have to wait and see